Hey everyone, this is Pete Bond with the CPG Guys podcast. I wanted to let you know that our podcast is being sponsored by PowerViews, a product rating and review software company. If you're interested in getting feedback on your products, learning from that, sharing it with retailers carrying your products, answering questions your consumers have, and even getting an understanding of what the shopping experience is like, check out PowerViews. They have some great solutions. Just visit www.powerviews.com. Now on to our episode with Brian Sappington, the Chief Digital Integration Officer at Coca-Cola. We hope you enjoy it. Thanks. Welcome to another episode of the CPG Guys podcast. Our co-hosts, Sri Rajagopalan and Peter V.S. Bond, explore how brands and retailers engage with consumers online, in-store, and everywhere in between. And now, here are Sri and Peter. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the CPG Guys podcast. I'm your co-host, Peter V.S. Bond. I'm also Vice President of Retail Strategy at Power Reviews, a product rating and review software company. As always, I'm joined by my co-host. He is an e-commerce veteran of notable consumer packaged good companies like J&J, Revlon, and the Frito-Lay division of PepsiCo. Uh, he's also an accomplished entrepreneur. He is the cornbread stuffing to my yams. He's the Tampa to my St. Pete and the vodka to my ginger beer. Please join me in welcoming the man known as Shri. Shri, how are you today? Peter, thank you so much. This is always a pleasure to do this with you. I actually can't get wait to start this episode because it has to do with my alma mater, PepsiCo. So uh, I'm going to wait for our guest to get introduced. But when I'm not doing this, as you folks know, I've also helped launch Zenfuel. 100% natural supplements brand to help aid your sleep, energy, better movement, stress and anxiety relief and male wellness. Do check it out at www.zenfuel.com or simply search Zenfuel on Amazon. Z-E-N-F-U-E-L. Zenfuel, where your happiness is our ambition. And I can't wait to get started. Nice tagline, Shree. Thank you for that. Before we get to our guest, let me remind our audience that you can find all of our content. Our audio podcast is on over 15 platforms. We have a YouTube channel with playlists from our profit series, our retail series, our women's leadership series, and there's so much more. Just go to cpgguys.com. You can find it all there. And uh, we also like to promote other podcasts for people to listen to. Today, I want to recommend you check out OmniTalk by our friends Chris Walton and Ann Mazenga. The podcast explores the future of omni-channel retailer, uh, retail rather. We like it. We think it's great. Please check out OmniTalk. So on to what we're here for today, the main event. Our guest today is the Chief Digital Integration Officer for North America at the Coca-Cola Company. In fact, he spent his entire professional career at Coca-Cola. He worked his way up the sales organizations with roles supporting mass merchants, the club channel, the value channel, the convenience channel, the food service. Wow, he's got a lot of really deep experience working across multiple retail verticals. He moved into his, into his current role at the beginning of last year, and he's here to share with us how leadership skills and values are enabling business transformation efforts by establishing a networked organization, creating business value through multidimensional stakeholder engagement. It's a mouthful, but he's really going to tell us about how just building a roadmap isn't enough. You really have to build consensus and bring stakeholders along. I think that's what he's going to be able to share with us today. So please join uh, us in welcoming Brian Savington. Brian, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Uh, really fantastic to be here with both of you. You know, you talked about the, the ginger to your beer. Maybe, maybe Street could be the Coke to your Jack. I don't know. That, oh, that I, I, I was this close to using it. I was also thinking of some some nice Sprite Cosmo cocktails that would there you have, go that would have been a good addition. But it's we interesting. Stuff. We could, I, you know, I met I him prefer... when, when I was working uh, uh, for IRI on the PepsiCo business, and then I moved to Dunhumby, where I got to know the Coca Cola system so well. And so I've I've kind of I, I feel like I'm the bridge of this conversation. <laughs> I would have personally felt I would have personally really preferred the Coca Cola to my Jamaican drum. Oh, oh, okay, there we go. Too. I love it. I love Nothing it. Nothing wrong with that. So, uh, no, obviously, Sri and I are very happy to have you join us 
for this discussion, given that we all have roots in the uh, in the carbonated beverage or the sparkling category, depending on which company you're talking about. But um, we're not going to have cola wars today. We're only going to have thoughtful discussion. So before we begin, Brian, can you uh, just share with our audience a little bit about your business unit and what it is that you're trying to accomplish uh, around uh, digital integration within the Coca-Cola system in North America? Absolutely. So our team's got responsibility for the digital commerce efforts for the Coca-Cola uh, business in North America. And really what that means is, is we've got the responsibility for building out our capabilities and uh, our customer relationships across you know, business to business platforms, engaging in business to business uh, to consumer platforms uh, and leading those relationships. Uh, we have some uh, small direct to consumer businesses that we have as well. And so really across all those verticals, really playing in and, and delivering against our, um, our strategy of beverages for life so that we can uh, deliver against the, the plans and the, and the business uh, priorities for the North America operating unit, um, along with uh, helping design the digital strategy uh, for uh, the North America business in conjunction um, with our partners in, in our global business. That's very helpful. Thank you for that, uh, Brian. I know our audience will appreciate that for framing out our conversation. So why don't we get into that specifically? So as I understand it, the role you're in was newly created. So it wasn't like you were filling someone else's shoes and you already had a roadmap on exactly how you were going to, uh, to fulfill the objectives of this role. Can you tell us a little bit about bringing together uh, a, a fairly nascent digital team uh, and building out what you wanted to do? How do you go about doing that from scratch? Yeah, you know, we had digital sitting in a lot of different places and, and we had a, a great foundation with, you know, a, a, an e-commerce team working in the, the B2B2C space. And so we had a foundation there, which was great. And in your career, there's not many times where for a company that's over 130 years old, you get to do something that's totally new that's never been done before. And so it was pretty exciting to be able to be part of that effort to, to bring uh, together a really clear ambition and agenda, define a, a really clear culture, uh, establish uh, uh, some objectives around what it is we were trying to accomplish uh, so that we could get out um, and, and deliver against the strategy of the company and, and the needs and the role of the North America operating unit. And so, you know, some of the things that we, that we did right off the, off the bat is we really need to first understand uh, sort of the objectives and, and the parameters of, of what we were gonna do within the digital world. Digital is a really broad con, uh, context and, and it can mean a lot of different things. So really setting a firm definition, clearly identifying the metrics, um, you know, the upstream metrics and and the, the downstream metrics and how those were going to impact and, and get connected to the actual business were really important. Uh, understanding the key stakeholders and, and who, who it is we needed to partner with to get things done. Because what's interesting about our, I, I may have one of the most interesting titles in all of CPG with the digital integration. You know, there's not many people called the digital integration officer. And the reason why that it's integration is because it's about integrating it into the business. So we had to really figure out how we wanted to network across all of our different business units to not just drive you know, the, the, the digital commercial strategy, but embed the capabilities across the organization broadly. So Brian, we've used the word integration quite a few times. So uh, in any CPG organization, you can't be successful until you integrate what every person does into meaningful business processes in the company, as well as it's cross-functional in nature. What I heard you say is you've tried to bring together the various digital functions that exist cross-functionally across the company into operating as one. How about when you use the word integration, how do you then work back with say marketing, with the field teams that are responsible for so many different accounts and relationships, with food service perhaps, which is on-premise consumption more than anything else. And what does that word integration mean to you? And can you also help us understand how you're uh, executing it day by day for the brand? Sure, you know, for us, integration is, is about making choices and decisions commercially that on where we wanna place our bets. 
And then understanding based on kind of the bets that we're going to place, the partnerships and the work within the organization that needs to be done in order to deliver the metrics and the outcomes we have and following it all the way from strategy to execution. Uh, and that execution typically means um, a consumer actually transacts with it uh, and consumes it. That's, that's what execution is. And so for us, I'll, I'll just give you a, a, a brief example. If you were to think about uh, an amazing brand that we launched this year called AHA, it's a, it's a, sparkling, it's a sparkling water. Well, as you are building out that, that new innovation, you've got to make choices around your pack configuration from a, a pack price architecture. You've got to create the right sort of content. You've got to be able to figure out how you want to sample that product uh, and, and, and drive consumer engagement with it. You've got to figure out how you're going to use your, your marketing funnel and uh, the many opportunities you have uh, across uh, digital and social media platforms. And then you've got to figure out how you're going to drive conversion and actual transactions of that brand. In the past, the way we would have thought about that might've been almost exclusively into the physical world. Um, there may have been you know, some people um, who thought that digital was an opportunity saying, hey, we should maybe think about you know, doing something with digital. Maybe we will do something uh, with one of the digital media companies, or maybe we'll make some investment with a particular platform that's a retail platform. Uh, but, in, but instead of that, we have a very clear uh, strategy. We clearly understand the digital assets, the content that we need, the copy that we need, so that our um, product detail pages are where they, where they should be. We clearly understand the platforms that are going to be most critical to drive uh, uh, consumption and transactions. We understand the platforms that have the ability to drive the appropriate uh, sort of sampling efforts in, in the marketplace. And we're able to make choices and make investments uh, to raise the awareness of the brand, to drive trial and really create um, a launch that um, better reaches consumers. And I, I got to tell you, thank goodness we did that because uh, if we wouldn't have, we would have been a lot in trouble as COVID, as COVID hit, uh, right? Uh, yeah. In the, in the March timeframe. So right as the brand was starting, we really had um, uh, built out the, the ability to, to drive successful outcomes and drive the, the share gains and the, the consumption that we were looking to drive uh, because of, of how we had positioned um, the, the product. And so that, that really gives you an example from, from a retail standpoint. I think as you think about a food service on-premise standpoint, you know, for us, once again, it's starting with understanding the platforms that are most important. So you've got a lot of um, intermediaries working in the food service space today, working with restaurants, uh, digitizing their menus, acting as logistics companies to be able to deliver their, um, their products and their meals to, to consumers. And so we built strategic partnerships with those platforms uh, so, that, so that we can ensure that um, what we call um, the menus of our customers are optimized, uh, which is a benefit to everyone that's playing it. It's easier for consumers. They can get you know, a full meal that includes a side and a beverage. It's great for restaurants because um, that helps with their profitability and ensures uh, a higher average check. And then it helps the, um, it helps the aggregators because it, it in, improves uh, their overall kind of revenue position and margin position as well, uh, because it makes the deliveries more efficient. And so when you really define and create sort of winning solutions, you're, you know, for, for all the parties, you're able to implement and drive really great outcomes. And what's interesting is sometimes what we need to do from a digital standpoint is quite different than what we need to do uh, in, in, in the physical world. But in this particular instance, you know, having a bundled meal is something that we've been doing, I don't know, 50, 60 years or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it's just about, you know, translating some of those core insights and knowledge that we have into a new medium uh, that, that, that allows us to create value for consumers, create value for those platforms, customers, and for ourselves. When I think about Coca-Cola, the word innovation always comes to mind. Be it the introduction of the eight ounce glass bottle, which took the high-end restaurant food service business by storm, 
to my personal favorite, the Freestyle Machine, which revolutionized uh, QSR. And I, you and I could probably take another episode just digging into all the data you get from that machine. I'm, that, I'm a kid in a candy store with that. But what you've talked about in terms of your, your journey towards integration, there have got to have been some really great learnings that you developed around what were some of the enablers, what were some of the bottlenecks, what were some of the imperatives. We'd sure love to know what this integration journey uh, has, has taught you in terms of what's coming from the experience of getting it all together? Sure, you know, I'll start with maybe some of the challenges. And one of the big challenges that we faced um, was um, the access and the insights associated to the, the data that's out there. You know, there is a lot of data that's produced. The usability of that and the structure of that is not very good. And so simply understanding um, simple things like your marketplace position, especially when you're working with you know, companies that are doing click and collect where they're pulling inventory and that inventory is being sold from the physical store, make it very, very difficult. And for us, um, the, the modalities of local delivery and the modality of, of grocery pickup or click and collect or um, buy online and pick up in store whatever you want to call that, it's got like 25 names. Um, those modalities are much more important to us because we're, we're more tied to a food occasion versus sort of a single item purchase occasion in terms of the categories in which we compete. And as a result of that, the, the data and the insights and just the understanding and the ability to understand the size and the scale of a business, the ability to understand when you're executing things and how those things work is very difficult. So we actually have spent a decent amount of time just building out the infrastructure to understand our business, how we're performing in the marketplace, the financial implications to our own business, being able to tie that back to our, our core P&L versus just the shadow P&Ls that we have has been a really important sort of uh, effort and piece of work for us and is ongoing. I don't feel like I ever have the full picture or have all the answers compared to when I worked in physical retail uh, where uh, you know, all of those different uh, partners that you could choose from, from IRI to Nielsen, give you a really great sort of set of insight of data. So that was one challenge that was really important. I think another challenge um, sort of springing from that is, is the belief, uh, the belief uh, that various stakeholders have in the importance, uh, the urgency of the importance, especially prior to COVID. Uh, and, uh, you know, now post COVID, it's, it, it's, it's a slightly different scenario, but, but pre COVID, everyone would tell you that it was important, but not everyone believed that it was always urgent. And for us, we work in a broad stakeholder, uh, uh framework because we have franchise bottling ownerships that play a really important role. And so how we were to motivate, uh, create the belief uh, help people understand the information, especially when the data and the insights aren't all that great uh, compared to what you can see in other places. We really needed to find uh, the, the best approach. Uh, and for us, that, that meant working together to be really clear on what our ambition would be uh, for our business and what sort of um, agenda we were going to go execute against and then what the metrics were that told us whether or not we were gonna be successful and being able to measure those things and drive that accountability within the, the, the digital team and at those shared accountabilities with those other stakeholders. And we started to build belief and we started to build uh, trust and we started to, to demonstrate the value that we could create long before COVID-19 hit. So that when it did hit and a ch choices and decisions were very easy for uh, the leadership team across all of our stakeholders to make the decision to pivot quickly, deliver more resources to respond to where we knew consumers were gonna go. And fortunately we had spent the time, you know, and we're not perfect. Like we haven't reached our destination, don't get me wrong. You know, people are probably gonna go look at our stuff now and be like, oh, you have so many opportunities for improvement. Well, that is absolutely the truth. But we did get ourselves into a much better position um, so that when COVID hit, we were able to continue to accelerate 
And what we've really seen is incredible results. So we've doubled the business over the course of two years. We've seen our value share move up uh, almost three and a half points. We, we've seen you know, our beverage incidents improve by 10 points. We've added over 75,000 customers to our B2B platform. And so those kind of results only happen uh, when you are able to engage the totality of the stakeholders that need to get things done because you can't do it by yourself. You know, that, that's one of the things that I see with a lot of companies that attempt to build out a, a digital group. You know, though some people call me and ask me, so what, what do you think needs to happen? What, what needs to be done? And I, and I always say, you need to be really careful that you don't just get somebody that understands the technology. It doesn't actually understand how the business works, how the business makes money, how, um, how the relationships with stakeholders, uh, both internal and external stakeholders uh, works as well, because you've got to create the right commercial outcomes to demonstrate the benefit of the, of the digital business. And quite frankly, the commercial outcomes are, are really strong when you get your hands around them. You know, Brian, I've always felt, you know, I started this journey in digital around 2012 and I come from the brick and mortar world from PepsiCo. And I've always felt if you want to be successful commercially, like you rightly have just pointed out, the best grounding you can get to be successful in e-commerce and digital is if you come with a brick and mortar background, because you have been, quote unquote, forced to learn every aspect of the business inside out, and which gets even more complicated in a DST business model with labor unions and things of that nature and delivery bottlers multiple touch points every single day, things of that nature. So it's a pleasure to hear you say that. I think if you can be very qualified in the technology space, if you come with a tech background and still lead digital, but it'll be very hard to scale the numbers at the end of the day. So speaking of scaling the numbers and listening to the various points of integration, you know, like I said, I've been doing this eight long years across multiple grants. Looking at your resume, it sounds like you've been doing it about a year and a half and you sound like you're a veteran in the industry. So congratulations for that. Uh, that, that said, Brian, success at the end of the day, there's only one metric that I know of which truly measures success while there are a hundred that support it. And that true success metric is net trade sales. So if I were to ask you, Brian, what are the key metrics that you use to measure success in the organization and what are the drivers behind those metrics in such an amazing in, in integrated infrastructure that you speak to, what would those be? And then how do you personally drive accountability for it given a lot of the responsibility outcome don't necessarily sit with the digital commerce team, AKA such as the walmart.com business or many of the other .com businesses that are omni-channel in nature versus a pure play, which is like you said, so much easier to kind of figure out what's going on there given that the relationship is owned elsewhere. Yeah, sure. I, let me first just react and say thanks for the kind words. Um, and to your point, I, I don't want to say that, that a technology person can't be successful. Um, there's just different hurdles to your point that they'll have to overcome. I think what's really important about- Yeah, I don't want to misconstrue, Brian. So anybody can be successful in anything if they right. put their mind to it. That's not what I meant either. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just wanted to make sure I clarified my point um, as well, because to me, the, the only reason why you think uh, I sound like I know what I'm talking about and is because I don't claim to know everything. And I actually walked into this role with a really humble heart um, and the desire to learn. So I, I didn't come in, you know, defining uh, where we needed to go right off the bat. I actually came in and listened and learned. And there was a lot of people on my team that had much more depth of experience in this space than I had. And it was really critical for me to listen to them, to listen uh, what they had to say, to listen to the people that are on the ground. I mean, if, if you have the, the fortune to be part of a DSD company, to have the opportunity to talk with bottling ownerships that understand supply chain and logistics about as good as anybody can, that's the biggest part of the, the game as it relates to, to digital commerce. And so I was really lucky that I had really, really smart, capable people to help me learn along the way. And I can tell you this, I'm continuing to learn a whole lot um, just as we continue. As it relates to your, your, your questions around, what are some of the metrics that we look at? And so I, I would say the, the, you know, the key metrics we're looking at are, are net revenue, 
their um, their gross profit slash operating income. Uh, we're looking at return on investment. We're looking at transactions as well. Uh, and then we're, we're looking at things like value share. Uh, and then some, some more of leading indicators, you know, we uh, at Coca-Cola actually have a partnership with Edge. And so, you know, we're looking at our, our search results. We're taking a look at our product availability and we've combined several of those metrics into um, what we call our, our e red Brian, I don't mean to interrupt, but for the benefit of our listeners, could you decompose value share? Oh, sure. Absolutely. So, so value share is, uh, your uh, mix or percentage mix of uh, the total business within the categories in which you compete uh, from a from a retail sales perspective. So that's that's what we're we're looking at in terms of value share. Um, and and then the, the the downstream metrics that we're looking at, the upstream metrics that we're we're really looking at, de- depend on the the various plat uh, you know, kind of category of, of business that we're looking at. So. From a B2B standpoint, we're owning that customer relationship and what we need to deliver in order to improve our net revenue and our profitability is different than when we look at B2B to C. So in our B2B business, we're, we're taking a look at things like active adopted. So how many active adopted users do we have? We're, we're taking a look at things like lifetime value. We're understanding you know, things like cart abandonment and things of those nature, conversion, all those, those metrics in that nature. And that's actually a little more similar to some of the D2C metrics that we have, because on both of those, it's about the journey that your user is on and driving transactions within that journey and making sure that you're delivering the appropriate sort of uh, uh, product uh, brand and need for the consumer there. As it relates to our business to business consumer, it, 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 it definitely sort of fits across both retail and food service. So in our food service business, we talk a lot about uh, digital attachment rates or incidence rates, and that's a really simple uh, metric that that measures the percentage of um, of beverages that are included uh, with the with, with a, a food order. So it's it's basically you know yeah. out of a hundred people, how many people got a drink with their food order? We'd like that to be one hundred, right? That's a really good number. And so we're, we're always looking at that, that number and trying to improve that. We're taking a, we're taking a look at um, things like uh, our, our, um, our ability to, to fulfill um, an, an availability of products um, and, and are we actually available on menus uh, and things of that nature as well. And then in the, in the more sort of retail uh, uh, for, formats from a platform standpoint, there we're looking at, you know, the quality of our product detail pages. We're looking at, you know, the availability, our in-stock rates. Uh, we're taking a look at our search scores, all of those different areas to, to help us understand um, whether or not we're able to, to generate the value that we, that we want to generate. Brian, you have no idea how thrilled I am to listen to a senior leader from a large scale DST brand actually chat with us about the importance of the pro- importance of the product detail page, and the word that I generally call a kryptonite of large brands, which is lifetime value. So from my side, that's for those who for those who are listening, that's a salute. He's doing his salute. That's a, that's a that's a big acknowledgement from Shree. So thank that's you, awesome. Brian. I will say on my end that as you talk about your ability to measure all this, I think you know I'm quite familiar with the team that helps you do the insight work. And I think you got some between, you know, Joe, Celia, a bunch of others. Um, You've got a great crew on board to help you do that. So congratulations on that. My question is around as as you've done all of this, a culture starts to emerge. I wanna hear from you what you think uh, the culture of this new entity that you've created is, and how is that really actually supporting your ability to accelerate the integration? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think the first thing I'd say is, is we work in service of the purpose of the Coca-Cola company, which is to refresh the world and make a difference. And, and when you have a purpose you really can believe in you know, from your company, it, it helps a lot of things fall into place. Uh, and, and with our purpose, we have, you know, a, a defined set of, of growth behaviors. 
um, that that we that we articulate and we we share with um, with our with our teams things like being agile, being inclusive, um, being um, you know being learners and, and things of that nature. And so we we sort of take the the high level view of, of what we want to be as an organization. But as I uh, had an opportunity to be part of this team and bring this group together, we also said to the, to the organization, and, and not just the DIO, but we brought in the people that we knew we were gonna work with quite a bit, our bottling ownerships, uh, our brand partners, our strategic marketing partners, um, our retail um, and uh, customer teams. And you know, if there's an organization whose role is to drive the digital uh, revenue and profit of the business, the digital capabilities of the business, what sort of culture do we need to have mutually to be successful? What sort of culture do we need to have for this ambition? We have an ambition um, that, that lays out trying to drive 4 billion in digital commerce uh, system revenue just in North America by 2024. So what is it that we need to do together to, to create the kind of environment where those kind of things could happen? And so we, we jointly defined that and we, we talked about it in two ways. We said, you know, who are we? You know, we're problem solvers, we're learners, we're a network of leaders, we're trailblazers. And then we said, what is it that we're gonna go do? And, and we said, we're gonna build connections, we're gonna enable action, we're gonna leverage unique skills and we're gonna build trust. And what I've seen and what's been incredible to me over the course of the last almost two years now is to see not just the, the folks that sit within the, the DIO really doing everything they can to create an environment that that culture actually is real, but I see it in the people that are working with us. You, you know, we, uh, we have this, this program called short-term assignments where people can raise their hand and say, I wanna learn about something different and new. And on top of my responsibilities, I wanna invest in another part of the business. Well, just this year alone, we've had over 90 short-term assignments. And when I talk with those people, because I always have conversations with everyone that comes into our group, they're not always like 45 minute conversations, but I, I wanna get engaged and understand what the experience is like for my teammates. What all of them tell me is, Brian, you talk about the culture and I, I feel it every day. I feel it from my teammates and it creates a sense of belonging and a sense of safety that allows the team to take the kind of risks and have the kind of belief in one another to go get things done. And you know, that Brian, is what a, what a great program your company offers because it, it allows someone to engage in learning in an area that they don't have they still continue to do their day job. So there is a commitment on their part to give a little more. And, but I'm sure that for the departments that are embracing these, that's also a commitment to them to give a little more to help, help share and educate. So we've talked in the past with other guests about how does someone from a sales role move into an e-commerce role. The fact that Coca-Cola has codified this into a into a program, uh, what a gift to its employees. So uh, kudos to you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the same salute that Shree did. Well, I can't take credit for the, for the program. I'll take credit no, for, for, but for the fact for that it's hold of it. But really, yeah, I mean, I think, I think what we've talked about as a company is the, the importance uh, of, of being willing to learn, the importance of continuing to improve and enhance and advance your capabilities. And people can only really do that through real experience. You can only take so many courses that tell you about things. We actually learn by doing. And so we've had a, an incredible opportunity. And I think the folks that have been part of our short-term assignments, if you give it, if you bring it, <laughs> if you are invested in it, you're gonna build your skills and capabilities and you will have examples that will allow you, because at the Coca-Cola company, almost everything we do is through interviews. We don't just promote people typically. You will have the opportunity to, to bring those examples forward into those interviews. You'll have the experience that when you go back into your core role, 
that you actually understand what needs to be done digitally and you're going to build your own capabilities. And, and it's been so incredible to, to see that happen. Great. So Brian, let's talk a little bit about leadership because clearly I can hear that emanating in every corner of this conversation we've had so far and that billion dollar ambition. I have no doubt y'all will blow it out of the water. That said, what is leadership by example in this space? And then how do you bring your authentic full self to that leadership by example and actually set the tone for the company, especially as it comes with the board and very senior leaders at the brand to make sure that the vision and strategy your team has, eventually you have, actually do get played out in reality in the field? Yeah, I think, I mean, when I think about leadership, I think quite a bit about service. And for me, the best kind of leadership is servant leadership. And the reason why that's the best kind of leadership from my point of view is because that leadership starts with what's, what's the purpose? What is it that we're trying to go do together? You know, we're, we're all part of something bigger than ourselves. We're all giving a, a significant portion of our lives to something. How are we collectively going to advance to a specific purpose? And if, if you can get your head around the purpose of, of your organization, then as a whole, then you can define the role that your organization plays within the context of that purpose. And, and that's really what we've tried to do is, is, is really clarify the role that we have, which is all about digitally enabling our brands to refresh the world and make a difference. Uh, and, and then from there, it's, it's about understanding that it's not about you. Leadership is not about the leader. Because when it becomes about the leader, it sucks. <laughs> In all honesty, it's terrible. Leadership is about understanding the needs of the external environment, understanding your purpose, and then inspiring and building your team and your capabilities in your organizations, both as individuals and as an organization, to go out and, and uncover those opportunities and, and advance them. And you do that not by um, demanding of people, you do that by inspiring people, by believing in people, by creating a culture of safety, by creating belonging, by driving clarity of priorities and listening to people and adjusting the way that you engage based on the feedback that you're getting. And at times not adjusting because there's certain things that, that you've got to do because you know they're right. And you've got to lead people there. You've got to have the hard conversations with folks. And so that's really what we've tried to do. And it takes more than one leader to make that happen. I'm incredibly blessed with the leadership team that are, is a part of the organization. You know, the folks that are direct reports to me. Because the only way this culture that we've talked about today actually comes to life is if those folks are living it. If they believe in it if they're willing to be servant leaders, if they're willing to help understand and listen and adjust to what their teammates are saying and not caught up in you know, what it is about for them all the time. And don't get me wrong, we all have a personal set of needs. We all have ambition. We all have our own motivations. And those aren't, those aren't bad things. Those, but those cannot be the things that control your decision-making. The things that control your decision-making need to be around your strategy, that links to your company's purpose, that clearly delivers the role of the business that you're responsible for. Thank you, Brian, from the bottom of my heart for that incredibly humbling guidance on leadership. Oh, thanks. Don't Hope talk. I can live that way. Hopefully the, all the comments won't be, well, Brian talks a good game. We'll see, we'll see what happens. <laughs> the well, NTA, man, that's what matters. <laughs> Brian, when I, when I was at Dunhumby and I was calling on Coca-Cola, I dealt with knowledge and insights. I dealt with category advisory, uh, revenue growth management. There was the bottling franchise. These are all stakeholders, right? Yep. And you mentioned this earlier. You deal 
with an enormous number of stakeholders. Not everybody in the organization reports to digital integration. Yeah. So you have to have some ability to influence without necessarily having uh, control over the decisions that are being made. Um, how do you drive alignment and success in an organization where there are so many different stakeholders? What, is, what are kind of the, the key elements that, that you use to try and build consensus and, and move, move the ball forward towards the goal line? So, I mean, I think, I think you're not gonna sound a little bit like a, a broken record, but it does start with the purpose of the company and everything should flow from there. Um, you know, North America has a role within the context of what the Coca-Cola company needs us to do within North America. And then within North America, you know, each of those functions you talk about have, have a specific role that they need to play. So a lot of what you need to do is, is, is one, you've got to understand the strategy of the business, the outcomes of the business. Like what are we actually trying to, to, to accomplish? Um, what, what sort of environment do we want to create for, for our teammates? What sort of results do we need to deliver in terms of revenue, profit, value share, and, and transactions? And, and by understanding, you know, the, the metrics and the outcomes that you need to deliver, you can start to see across each of those different stakeholders, the role that they play, start to listen and understand to what their needs are, what it is they're trying to accomplish. And then you're able to position digital as a solution uh, across so many of those different stakeholders because of the significant trajectory of growth that's expected and that we've experienced, uh, because of the rapid change that it's delivering and because of the, the rapid change that's happening with consumers, you, you can't have anyone, I believe, that would take a look and say in 10 years, digital commerce is not gonna be more important than it is right now. It's not gonna be a greater share of the business. It's not gonna have a broader impact to the way consumers think about your business. And so once you can get the buy-in associated to the long-term implications to the business, that's, that's important. Then you've got to under, help people understand how the urgency is now and, and how when you take action, you actually can deliver results that can be meaningful to the scale of the business. Because what happens with a lot of folks is they're unable to demonstrate the scale. So we not only like to share how much we grew, we like to share the percentage of the overall growth that we delivered and how that far outweighs the current mix of the business that we are today. We like to share things like how we are able to, to, to influence consumers through the various platforms we have in new and different ways to drive to transactions. Uh, we like, to, we like to, to, to share how there's risk associated to our business that if we're not right and customers are moving to these channels, there's inherent, you know, leaky, there's a leaky boat and you're just gonna see transactions and consumer engagement and revenue, you know, fall out of your business that you're gonna have to figure out how you make up for that on the top line. And then there's also, also a decent amount of efficiencies you can drive in, in, in several of these channels. So how you, how you think about how you improve your operating margins and drive enhancements, you know, not just in the top line, because I think sometimes people get a little too obsessed with the top line. There's margins that you need to actually deliver for the business. Um, the profitability of what you can deliver and the long-term profitability is really important. Uh, so, so those are some of the things that, that we've done to, to drive influence. Um, and I think maybe the most important thing is we brought people in together to help shape the ambition for the organization. We didn't tell them this is what we're gonna do. We invited them in to participate. And when people have ownership in something, they tend to, uh, they tend to wanna to see it be successful. And so for us, that's been super helpful. So Brian, obviously, you know, working with people and stakeholders, as you mentioned, is not new to your life. You've been at Coca-Cola quite a while, you know, almost your entire career journey. And um, in the process, you work in brick and mortar or the offline channel prior to taking on to this new role. And uh, you've dealt with perhaps the same stakeholders in a previous life and this new life over here. What's been different in how you deal with them and the type of conversations you have in your previous life offline world 
versus your current life, which is the online world? Yeah. Well, I think one thing that I've really tried to do, and, and this started actually before I actually took this role, is I've, I've really tried to just talk about it in terms of it's, it's commerce. We create this separation of, of physical versus digital because it's the way we can think about routes to market and there's slightly different business, different situations as it relates to the business on what you actually need to do. But the consumer is just thinking about, I have something that I need, I need to make a purchase. What's the easiest, most convenient? What's gonna deliver the most value to me? And so I think this idea of, of you know, just new commerce, just of commerce, it's, it's not really a separation is really important for us to all be moving to over time and thinking about how we're gonna reach consumers in a way that matters to them, not, um, and, and shape, those, shape those intentions with consumers through the way that we market and, and, and the way that we provide uh, information to them. But I think you know, some of the differences between the two, I would say that um, it was a lot easier for me to be able to generate ROI analysis and facts and figures in the physical, when I had you know, responsibility for the physical world. All that conversation we had earlier around the, the, the data is not clean and there's not great information makes it much more difficult to, to be able to share and have really clear line of sight on, on, on the value that's created for, for those stakeholders. There's also a different set of metrics that, that we have to use sometimes like uh, return on ad spend and getting people to really understand how that plays and translates, you know, we spend a lot of work. So we have to spend a lot more time, I would say, educating. Educating in terms of um, the financial implications, educating in terms of what's important. In fact, one of the things that we've done is we've tried to simplify things. We, we, we say that we like to translate the physical to the digital. So, you know, what's an end cap in the digital world? Well, it's a display, <laughs> it's a digital display. What's your, what's your shelf, your physical store shelf? Well, it's, it's your digital search terms, right? Do you have first position? So, so trying to create these connection points uh, between what people know in the physical world, because I can have a conversation and I could talk shorthand with those stakeholders and the conversation we'd have would go really fast to be able to come to decisions. But because now I have to do a portion of what I'm doing is educating. And because people don't have the same gut feels, you know, people have a gut feel for if I'm going to run a promotion, I, 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 I know, I've seen it happen. I know what it means. I know what it's going to do. Well, I come in with my facts and my figures and it doesn't hit their expectations and they don't necessarily believe it. Right. And so, and so how you continuously provide that data build and educate along the way and do it in a manner that's helpful and, and don't allow yourself to get frustrated or be condescending is super important. And that's why you really have to humble yourself to say, what is the outcome I'm trying to deliver? And, and how do I really listen to what this person is saying? Because if they're not getting it, that's not because of them, that's because of me. What do I need to do to adjust in the way I'm communicating that? So I've had to have a lot of, uh, soul searching, I think, uh, with myself to, to figure out how to redirect ideas and, and communicate things uh, to help educate people. You know, Brian, this has been one of the most, uh, not just uh, soul searching, as you've already said, but entertaining at the same time. I think I see eye to eye with you in my own journey, having grown through the ranks and leading very large organizations in e -com, I've always felt that uh, e -com leaders biggest learning and role is that it's incredibly humbling and there's going to be 99 no's before a single yes comes and if you get frustrated in the journey because of all the 99 yeses versus the one no's you got in the brick and mortar journey your odds of successful are going to diminish and the way i flipped it around as best is wearing the person on the side uh, the other side of the table their shoes and understanding why they say a no and that's what i meant by earlier when you have brick and mortar training you're able to understand when you go to ask for a capital expense of some sort on e-com when someone says no, what the motivation is behind the no. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, we definitely see eye to eye. Yeah. Look at that. We're coming together. Oh my God. I feel a, I, a cola hug coming. Cola hug.
Um, we, we can go on about this for hours, Brian. I, I, but I, do I, we have time for one more, Peter? We'll just cut three more. Uh, I will say this, when it comes to measuring digital influence, um, it's kind of like what Tom Hanks said about baseball and the league of their own. If it were easy, everybody would do it. Yep. So kudos on you for, for working towards that and trying to help educate and be understanding of the people uh, on the other side of the table from you for, for doing that. So you talked a lot about servant leadership uh, and you talked about listening a lot. So you've done that and you've had some time to start building your organization out. They're, they're moving and obviously you're delivering some great results. Looking forward, what do you see your role as? What are the two or three things that you as a leader are gonna really focus on to empower your team to, to excel even more than they already are? Well, I, I think prioritization just continues to be important. Um, really, you know, allowing people to focus their efforts and intentions on the things that are going to have the biggest impact. And it's really easy to get yourself sidetracked on, on things that are shiny and, and nice, but um, aren't going to create a lot of value. So I, I think that prioritization will continue to be something that we really will, will drive. The culture and continuing to, to create the right kind of culture is not a something that you can check the box on. Every single day, your behavior, your actions, the choices that you make uh, matter. I can tell you if, if I get on a call and I'm stressed um, or I'm short with someone, that's not something that's always forgotten right away. So I have to, as a leader, recognize and when I'm not right, I got to apologize and adjust and come back to, to, to my teammates. And so making sure every single day that culture is where you want it to be so that you can get the most out of your team, so they can get the most out of themselves uh, is really important. And then I, th I think the third piece is, you know, we're really going to have to, to begin exporting talent. So it's not about how do we create this incredible digital organization. But this organization is going to have to continue to evolve. So as we move into 2021 and beyond, I would expect our, our digital group to continue to, to evolve and change and, and adjust. And, and we're going to you know, have leaders that are, are, are part of our team that will move into new parts of the organization to help embed the capabilities and the thinking um, throughout the organization. You can't allow the digital organization to live in a, on an island on its own not taking uh, a, a teammates in from other parts of the business and, and building it and then keep them there. You've got to have this you know, flow of, of, of people out to the business and into the business, uh, different parts of the business. You, you cannot allow it to be some sort of separate thing that's just done on the side. It has to be integrated into the business. In a rare and the only departure in 50 odd episodes we've had from closing the show with a question, I'm actually going to take 60 seconds to recap for the audience. What a great episode this has been to hear something like this from a senior leader in digital and e-commerce. So number one, Brian, you referred to so many traits of leadership over here, but the one that I took away the most was humility. If you're humble in this journey in digital and e-commerce, things will happen and you'll crack the code. The second was in terms of success, if you're a servant leader and you listen to people and you're willing to flex and bend and not be short, as you said, or perhaps you said not be curt because people will remember the numbers will follow. Um, at the end of the day, the numbers will follow and the results will be delivered. The third thing I took away was people, 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 people leverage those extensive networks that you built over your career, lean on them, participate with them, educate them, coach them, and take them along with you. I, I can't tell you what an awesome conversation this has been. So I'll turn it back. I'm tempted to ask you in a very in sh short 30 seconds, Brian, what's next in terms of digital and the brand? I think what's next is continuing to unlock the connection and the relationship with consumers through all the different platforms that are out there so that we can really better meet their needs um, and refresh them 
however, wherever, and whenever they want our brands. Um, and when we do that, we have the investments and the resources we need to be able to make a difference uh, in our business and in our communities. All right. Thank you, Bill. I want to remind our audience that all of our content, links to our audio podcast on whatever platform you choose, our YouTube channel, the e-commerce glossary that our friend Adam Rose developed, the full list of our favorite podcasts. We talked about OmniTalk at the beginning of this episode. You can find links to all that at cpgguys.com. Also, if you happen to have a virtual assistant around your house, you want to be entertained and educated at the same time, just ask him or her to play the CPG guys. Trust me, it'll work. I won't mention her by name because if I do, I'm going to set off all of your virtual assistants at once and that wouldn't make you happy. I'm trying to leave you going away from this, this episode of the podcast uh, happy as can be. So just make sure you do that and, and you'll get a lot from, from what we have to offer. All of this is freely available to you. So Brian, I really want to thank you for joining us. I have a lot of friends in the Coca-Cola organization Glad to add you to the to the list. It's good to know another great leader in the organization, and and I'm very excited about what you're creating for the organization. Can you tell our listeners, and particularly say any any Omni Channel or Pure Play uh, ecom retailers out there that out the services that your organization in particular uh, help could help them with? Sure. I First, let me just say thanks for the opportunity. I really enjoy the conversation. Um, you all are easy to talk to, which is why you do a great job. So thanks for that Thank opportunity. You, you know, I, you know, we we love our we love our many partners, and you can work with us in a number of different ways. If uh, if you're looking to order products from Coca Cola, uh, you can go to mycoke.com and download us on Android and or Apple devices. Uh, our MyCoke app, uh, 4.9 stars on Apple. It's a pretty good rating. We're pretty proud of that. And then um, I think they have more. We have the same average rating, but I don't think we have as many ratings as you have. <laughs> I'm just saying. And then um, you know, obviously, for for the, the larger sort of retail and food service partners that we have out there, you certainly can connect with your individual sales person who's got direct line to our organization. Uh, we work with lots of different customers to help ensure that um, we're able to drive transactions for your business drive profitability for your business and, and leveraging our incredible broad set of brands that we have uh, that we're really proud of and fortunate to have. So uh, those are some of the ways that we can, I think we can help folks. Thank you for that, Brian. And we wish your organization the best of success in hitting your multi-billion dollar uh, digitally influenced sales objective by 2024. I have no doubt you're going to hit it. I, I'm, not, I'm not the least bit concerned. Um, so Brian, thank you for that. Shri, wow, another one right up, right up our alley, right in our wheelhouse. Love talking about this space and couldn't have gotten it from uh, a more knowledgeable person. So very excited about that. Thank you, Peter. Pleasure doing this week over week with you, episode over episode. And Brian, thank you so much for coming to the show. I can't wait to get this one out. To our audience. Don't forget to leave us a rating and a review on the Apple podcast platform. We like them. We listen to your feedback. It helps guide our strategy, what we talk about, the topics, et cetera. Just go to tinyurl.com slash Apple CPG podcast. It'll take you right to their site. Give a star rating. We like the fifth one. It's one of our favorite. Not telling you have to, but it's up to you. Any, and particularly write a review because we want we do read the reviews and we want your feedback. So we look forward to you all joining us on the next episode of the CPG Guys podcast. Have a great day. Goodbye. <laughs>